Progress has resulted from the development of productive ideas and production facilities by people with initiative and courage, people with a spirit of adventure. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Decrypting Crypto podcast. I'm Matthew House Barbie. And I'm Austin Knight. And today, you're in for a real treat. Now that we've completed our first season of the Decrypting Crypto podcast, we're going to be releasing a string of episodes where we interview industry leaders within the blockchain space. So you can learn more about the projects and the people that are moving this whole industry forward. And it's worth mentioning, Matt, that none of these interviews have been or ever will be paid for. That is correct. You will only ever hear from people that we've personally vetted, at least to the best of our ability, and that we believe are doing interesting things in the space that are actually worth hearing about. Absolutely. Just before we get started and introduce our first ever guest on the podcast, which I'm super excited about, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all of our listeners. We've had an incredibly positive response to the first season of the podcast. All of those kind messages that we've had via email, social media, reviews left on various podcast platforms, they all mean a lot to us. And on the note of reviews, we have one quick ask from you. If you've enjoyed the podcast and have learned even one tiny thing from it, it would honestly help us out a ton if you could leave a rating and, if you're up for it, a written review on iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform of choice. We're doing our best here to reach as many people as possible and help them learn about blockchain. So once you're done with listening to this episode, search for the Decrypting Crypto podcast and leave us a review. Yeah. Thank you, everyone that is supporting us so far. And thank you to you. Yes, you, our wonderful listener. So one final thing that we just want to call out is you can actually get in touch with both myself and also Austin. You can ask us any question you like. You can give us feedback or you can just show some appreciation or some hatred, depending on how you're <laughs> feeling. And you can do that by emailing us at podcast at the coin offering. Dot com. Okay, with all of our appreciation out of the way, let's move on to introducing our first guest on the Decrypting Crypto podcast. All right. Today, we're going to be speaking with Taylor Monahan, the founder and CEO of MyCrypto. Welcome to the podcast, Taylor. Thanks so much for having me. So you have a super interesting backstory and path into this space. So I think we would love to start there, just hearing about who you are and how you got involved in the crypto space. Tell us about yourself. Yeah, thank you. So I think that, and this is pretty typical of most people in this space, everyone has like a pretty unique journey um, because they're, they're, isn't really like, uh, you don't really go to college and major in cryptocurrency. <laughs> so, uh, for example, I went to college for film and television. I went to NYU and I dropped out of NYU to basically focus on just making movies. And it was really, really an exciting time of my life. And then, you know, when I was trying to get like my first real job out of school and the, the recession was hitting pretty hard and <laughs> the film and television industry doesn't pay very much, you know, I was exploring a lot of different avenues on how to, you know, be financially stable. And I found that, you know, doing web design and development was a bit more steady than, than film and television was at that time. And from there, you know, I don't exactly know like when or how it was, but, you know, something about reading some articles about Bitcoin or having friends who talked about Bitcoin or, you know, something like that, you know, for whatever reason, it piqued my interest and I kind of latched onto it. And that's sort of like this this is the part of the story that everyone sort of has some version of it's they hear about cryptocurrency or bitcoin or ethereum or whatever it is and then they fall down this rabbit hole and it's just this like amazing magical experience where they realize sort of the potential of it and what makes it you know unique and special and why the world would be a better place with it and all of those sorts of things and so i definitely 
it took a while for me to fully like fall down the rabbit hole but and taylor when when roughly was it that you fell down the rabbit hole you, you <laughs> like, we're, we're, yeah we, we've got to we've got to have a time stamp here yeah so i would say that it was okay so when bitcoin went up this is it has to be like 2013 2014 and then mount gox happened oh wow that's when i was just getting interested in it and then really i was kind of diving down that rabbit hole as the price was tanking and the ecosystem was really sad and depressed and then i would say that i really kind of became committed to it or developed like an, a, a real emotional attachment to it much later like when the ethereum white paper started being passed around and then when ethereum launched that's when i like started bonding with the community and making friends and working with people and you know all of those sorts of things and that's when you know that's when i say the magic really happened <laughs> <laughs> and and you mentioned so you started out in this environment of film and tv and you then jumped into something pretty drastically different in terms of like development like what even caused that jump in the first place I had this job. Uh, I was hired to like photograph like pictures of their the the products and like Photoshop the backgrounds out of them for the website and stuff. And I basically didn't want to be fired. And I didn't feel like I could fill a week with taking product photos and shooting product videos. Like I didn't I just I knew that I wasn't providing like enough value to the company. So I essentially like would quickly teach myself any little skill to make myself just like a little bit more valuable so that I could hopefully not be fired. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and like, it turns out that, you know, like it's really hard to, at least for me, the way that I learned, it's quite hard for me to be like, okay, I'm going to go be a developer now. Like that path does, it just doesn't really work, but it's really easy to say, Hey, how do you add an image to a website? Like if there's an existing website here, how do you do that? And, you know, between Google and Stack Exchange and random forums, it's pretty easy to figure out. And so that's sort of how I like got started with development it was like literally like I had these photos that I was seeking. How do I put them onto the website now? And then from there, OK, how do I add this text or how do I style this text or whatever it was? Literally just trying to be useful. <laughs> So it was kind of you you just self-taught a lot of this stuff uh, mm -hmm. just to ensure you didn't get fired. <laughs> right. And then I, you know, and then the thing is, is that when you are learning with a goal, like with a really tangible end goal in mind, like I want to make this website or I want to update this website or I want to do this one specific thing, I find that it moves much faster it's much more interesting. It's much more fun. And you learn so much so quickly. And so, you know, before I knew it, I was pretty proficient in your basic HTML and CSS. And then I started taking like some night classes and some online classes and really like diving deep into sort of the whole website, like design development type world. And it turns out that that world is not super different from like the film and television world because it's still all about figuring out how to display information and tell someone's story and make something interesting that's going to capture people's attention like all of those sort of core concepts are identical it's just that the the medium is different right like if it's the, mm. it's the is this something that you're going to be watching on youtube or in a in a movie theater versus you know a website that's going to be shown like on your computer or on your phone or whatever you absolutely you mentioned that uh everybody sort of has a different path into this space, right? Because you, like you said, you can't just go to NYU and say, I want a degree in cryptocurrency. But you did manage yes. to take yourself down quite a tech forward path to eventually get to where you are now. Do you find that there are certain qualities that people, despite their different paths into blockchain and, and crypto tech, that everybody seems to have in common? Or is it really just like a mixture of completely random people? What would you look for in, in somebody getting into this space? So I think that the common sort of traits aren't necessarily like 
where people come from or what their degrees are in, but more of like personality traits or characteristics. And like one of the big ones is people tend to be like really, really curious about things. So they may not be like an engineer per se, but they are just like one of those people that, that enjoys learning about how things work or how things are put together or why things are a certain way. I can say that especially, I've especially noticed this running a company, everyone on my team, like literally almost everyone is like a questioner. Like they question the world around them and they question the decisions that we make and that I make. And (laughs) that's something that's quite unique. Like the world in general is more well-rounded and you have people that are leaders and you have people that are followers and you have people that, you know, are pretty, you know, go with the flow. (laughs) But this is, the crypto space is definitely full of people who don't, they won't do something because you say do it. They're the people that are a little bit rebellious (laughs) and they want to know why they should do it before they, you know, before they spend any time on it. And I'm, by the way, the exact same way. Like my parents, my poor, poor parents. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you talked there, Taylor, about uh, running a company. Mm-hmm. Why don't you tell us a little bit about My Crypto to, to begin with? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, My Crypto started as originally we were my ether wallet and it was really this like side project it was a tool it was a utility it was just something that we were building to solve a problem that we encountered in our everyday lives and my crypto is basically like a big old expansion on that with some of the things that we never really did with my ether wallet like you know setting up a company properly and getting our our <laughs> our paperwork ducks in a row and that kind of stuff and from like a product standpoint you know what our big sort of goal and vision is is we want to make the blockchain more accessible we want to make cryptocurrency more accessible for everyone in this world and so right now we're doing that mostly via this wallet interface thing where you can go to the website You can go to our desktop apps, you can create a new wallet, you can send Ether, you can send your tokens, you can see your token balances, all of that kind of stuff. And moving forward, you know, we're going to look to expand our products to, you know, again, make everyone's lives a little bit easier and hopefully bring more and more people into this ecosystem and help them easily and safely and securely be able to do this whole crypto thing. That's that's the big goal for, you know, the next few years for us. Just just a little goal then. Just a small milestone, <laughs> yeah, right? <you> know. <laughs> just just exactly. completely revolutionize the world, I guess, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it is really it's an adventure. That's what I'll say. It is like a freaking adventure every day. And it's amazing. But like, I really underestimated how hard it would be to like create a product that allows a really, really diverse set of users to easily interact with the blockchain. And it's not that it's technically hard. It's not that it's hard to like write the code. Mm-hmm. It's hard to make a decision that keeps everyone happy or that doesn't come with unintended consequences or that, you know, is, is like a feature that we're designing, you know, does this make it easy for my mother to use it and Mm. for, you know, the super security obsessed researcher to do it. And those types of things have been just surprisingly difficult to, to sort of balance and, you know, especially just internally how we make decisions and what we're optimizing for and those sorts of things. And I don't know, it is a blast though. That's what I'll say. It is like, (laughs) I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. It's so exciting. Well, that's great. And, And you mentioned, would this product be something that your mom could use, right? Like you've talked a bit about that my crypto enables you to interface with the blockchain. What does that mean for someone who is not necessarily as familiar with cryptocurrency? They're learning a bit about what Bitcoin is and maybe they've just purchased some of their first like cryptocurrency. How would you describe what my crypto does and how they can use my crypto in, in that respect? Mm-hmm. That's an excellent question. So it's so it's like this is probably one of the most difficult things for people to really really understand because in the traditional world and even with things like coinbase 
you have this account where you have like your your username or your email address and your password and you're able to basically log into these third parties these systems right and these are centralized systems and they're on a server somewhere and they're in the cloud somewhere and what we do is not that at all <laughs> and it's really quite unique what we do is that we basically have created a visual layer that looks you know, pretty typical in terms of a website or an application that allows you to directly talk to the blockchain. So that means that instead of talking to our backend and our servers that are on our cloud where we're collecting all of your data, you're actually just talking directly to the blockchain. And this uses cryptography and it uses the the interface that we've built and for example, like the buttons that we've built and the colors that we've chosen to make those buttons and all of that stuff to try to you know help make that experience easier for you but it's it's just it's so different because we don't have accounts in the way that you're familiar with we don't have for example we don't have the ability to reset your password there are no email addresses like you will never <laughs> put your email anywhere on the site you know instead you're given these like strings of numbers and that's how it works and that's going to be probably <laughs> one of the biggest things that we're going to have to overcome to make this really, really usable for, say, my mother to use and understand is getting people to just fundamentally at their core understand that this isn't a bank. They're not interacting with a bank. There's no fraud protection. There's <laughs> all of those <laughs> types of things. I mean, this is something that myself and Austin, we've talked about this on some previous episodes with talking about kind of the challenges for adoption within this space and UX <laughs> within a lot of like interfaces to the blockchain are not only quite confusing for more advanced users, but almost terrifying for anyone new. Austin, we, we, we talked quite a lot about this, right? Yeah, I personally, and I've always thought that I could be feeling this way just because I'm a designer. So I view everything from a design perspective, but I definitely feel that the largest barrier to widespread adoption of blockchain and crypto tech is UX and design right now, just because everything is so opaque and difficult to understand. It's almost like a, a black box, even for more advanced or tech savvy users, not to mention, you know, this sort of like ambitious goal that everybody is, is sort of dreaming of right now, which is crypto for everybody, you know, regardless of, of your age or your tech comfort level. So it, I think that hearing about services like MyCrypto, where you are attempting at that goal, my instinct would be that that's ex absolutely what uh, this tech needs if it's, if it's going to achieve the ambitions that it's set out to achieve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I completely agree with you, by the way, <laughs> like the user experience, the the design. And, you know, I think that the the research part of it and understanding your users and understanding the different peoples that are using your product and those types of things like are definitely they need a lot of work. Like even on my crypto, they need a lot of work. There's so much low hanging fruit that you know, just sort of gets overlooked in the process of building the product and building the technology. And, you know, especially when the underlying protocols are developing and changing so much, it can be really hard to like perfectly prioritize all the things and do all the things <laughs> in general. <laughs> I can say that we're definitely focused on improving the the user experience and the design and really thinking hard about like what our product is and who our product is for and helping people make an informed decision so that when my mom shows up on the site, she shouldn't be scared. And right now, like yeah. we, we, we do kind of fall into the trap of like putting that big old modal that big uh -huh. pop up on <laughs> with all the scary yeah. red, you know, and we do that on purpose because we were seeing such, such a huge amount of loss that we were like, okay, you know, slap this thing on here and let's, let's see if we can like prevent some loss because in my opinion, if we save people a couple ETH, then we won, right? But in the long right. term or in the, you know, what what is the real solution look like? And I think the answer is, you know, my mom should be able to go to the site 
And she should feel confident and empowered that she's able to do this on her own and that she can, you know, with confidence, go and either purchase her her ether or purchase that token or view her balance safely or whatever it is right we want to we want people to not only be able to do that but to know that they can do that so they don't you know see this big old pop-up and go you know running for the hills and like never look (laughs) at crypto again taylor what do you find is the most common problem that people run into users of my crypto that you kind of see as like the biggest hold up point. You touched on a few things there, but is there one or two things that really stand out right now that's like a common thread that you're noticing? Um, God, we it's kind of like whack-a-mole. So I can <laughs> say that about a year ago, the biggest thing that we were seeing was like people like literally not properly saving and backing up their private keys and stuff. And I was like constantly surprised by that you know, or like, can you reset my password? And then it shifted into people like not even realizing that they should save their private keys. So there's like a difference. There's like the people that would save it and then lose it. And then there's the people that like just wouldn't even save it. And so we made like adjustments to the UI in order to basically like we wouldn't even give you your address until you've proven that you still have that, that you've saved that (laughs) private key somewhere. And then it evolved into the scams. And the scams are what we've been seeing for pretty much like, uh, yeah, just under a year now. I think they started, they really, really took off in July of 2017. So first it was the Slack scams where they would DM people some scary message. That transformed into, right now it's like these Twitter scams where they're like, send us 0.5 ETH and we'll send you 5 ETH back. And you have all of these replies and people are like, wow, just got this E. Yeah, this is amazing. Exactly. <laughs> and so, you know, these are all, they're all different scams, but they're all in the same vein, right? We're seeing phishing sites. We're seeing lookalike sites. We're seeing the scary messages. We're seeing the, you know, too good to be true messages. And so the biggest cause of loss right now is definitely, in my opinion, things that shouldn't be a huge cause of loss. Like, it's so disappointing yeah. to see. Although I will say, I guess it is better than, you know, exchanges being hacked every day, but not by yes. much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I think it's one of the things that myself and Austin talked about a couple of episodes ago, where we were actually talking about, like, how to store and transfer crypto and the different wallets, things like that. One of the things that, that we talked a bit about is, like, and this has been mentioned by other people as well, is ultimately the consumer is now becoming the bank when it comes to security. And there's a lot of incredibly empowering things about that. But do you think there's, I think there's also a valid argument that people are almost not ready to become the bank. And it sounds like there are a number of cases there. What, what are your thoughts around that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's the thing is that being your own bank is such an amazing concept, right? And it's it's perfect and it's revolutionary. It's everything we want until you realize that, you know, you're now responsible for your own personal security. You're now responsible for preventing fraud within your own little bubble. You know, obviously there aren't really any insurance solutions right now, but if there are or there, you know, in the future, you know, insurance solutions come to be, then you're going to be responsible for, you know, obtaining that insurance and (laughs) utilizing it properly and, you know, that kind of stuff. And yeah, I think it's just in general, I would say that people are not ready to be their own banks. That said, because that's incredibly depressing, right? Yeah, yeah. (laughs) That said, I think that everyone has the ability to be their own bank. I think that the the problem is, is that one, there isn't a great, like we do a lot to try to educate people, but we learn every day and we're not perfect at it. And while we try to get better every day, you know, there's only a certain amount that one player can, can do. So I think that's one of the things is that there's just not enough education and in instilling of like best practices. And then the other thing is that the entire ecosystem is quite immature and is developing at a really rapid pace, but we're just not there yet. And most of the people in the ecosystem are really, really technical people. They are researchers and engineers and you know, we have less designers in this space. We have less people from, you know, different walks of life. We have less people that, you know, most of the people in this space tend to be younger. And I think that over time, as 
the people that are helping build these products become more diverse. So, you know, different backgrounds coming from from different countries, working for like big corporations, like, you know, everything that, you know, makes the world what it is. When we have all of those types of people building the products in this space, we're going to see the education, the user experience, the design, and just generally how we tackle the different problems, we're gonna see all those things sort of click into place more. And then the end user is going to be able to be their own bank a lot more easily. So sounds like some incredible design opportunities there. And I also wanna do just a little bit of a victory lap here because Matt and I (laughs) harped on this uh, during series one as like, it's so important to understand what you're getting into and to store your currency in a smart way and be responsible with your keys. So if you haven't listened to the episodes that we did around that, do yourself a favor. Taylor has already touched on some of the horror stories. Go back to series one and uh, we've got some great tips on that. But continuing off of here, I want to kind of take us in a little bit of a different direction and address what may be an elephant in the room. Maybe not, but I would love to hear, Taylor, if you could shed a little light into the situation that unfolded regarding my Ether wallet and my crypto. It's kind of a, a fascinating story in this space. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it is a pile of drama. Um, <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't sound like the crypto space. <laughs> um, yeah. So you know, I kind of touched on it earlier when I said that you know when we were doing my Ether wallet, we may have not, we may not have really been prepared for the sort of the growth that the product saw. Uh, and we didn't, you know, we didn't set set out to build a company and, you know, have a huge amount of users or have even a product or a team. We basically were just building this little tool. And so when it turned into something that was much bigger and we didn't have the the paperwork and the company structure and, you know, the things that you typically do when you, you know, are running a business, obviously it's you know, a little bit difficult to, to go back in time and get those things set up. (laughs) So that's sort of the gist of like why the split happened. Obviously the things that, that people latch onto the most is the, the Twitter situation because I was operating under assumptions that were wrong and I shouldn't have done that. And, you know, essentially how I looked at the Twitter was, and you know, T- Taylor, just for just for our listeners who may not yeah. necessarily be as savvy, to us, could you just very? I don't want to like pull at this too much, uh, but like, what what exactly happened there? Okay, so yeah, so basically, when we split everything that was my Ether wallet, we basically let go of, but the Twitter account, not the Twitter username, the Twitter account, we took the Twitter account and just changed it to my crypto, and we did this mm-hmm. because. I had built this Twitter up and it was really like the the primary p- place that we communicated to people. And it was the place that we were, we utilized that Twitter as this like security beacon. Like we were tweeting about scams. We were warning people for like all of the ecosystem because it really did, it had a significant amount of followers in the space. And it was a little bit of like, you know, this thing that I built and I felt obligated to keep them updated about not necessarily just our products, but also like anything that went wrong in the space, whether that was like a DNS hack or, you know, some new scam that was going around, those types of things. So what ended up happening though, is that when we did that, people, instead of seeing it how I saw it, and this is where I say I was operating under the wrong set of assumptions, is that I assumed that everyone would understand why I did it. And I assumed that that it wouldn't be, you know, that it wouldn't cause more confusion. And what ended up happening was that that switch created more confusion in the community. And I felt really, really terrible about that. So then we ended up basically doing another switcheroo and, you know, the internet exploded and there was a ton of drama. And (laughs) I basically told the whole team to, to like, you know, heads down, kind of stay off social media and, you know, we release like a statement or whatever. But my main thing was like, let the drama sort of burn itself out uh, and focus on building and focus on what we do best. 
because my biggest priority is not necessarily like what's best for my crypto or like mm -hmm. let's make my crypto the biggest thing in the world like i honestly don't care very much about that at all my biggest priority is how can we make ethereum and the blockchain more usable and more accessible and i think that limiting confusion in the space and limiting confusion within the community and helping people interact with the blockchain more easily right like that's what i want and when i realized that the decision that i had made regarding the twitter was not doing that it was creating more confusion that's when i you know i definitely had like a oh shit, what did i do like i never intended yeah. this and so that was hard and that sucked really badly and the internet beat it must have been really tough i mean it must have been really tough right it just it sucks when it's so obvious to look back on something that you've done and just be like mm. <laughs> you should have seen that coming you moron that's what but i i i also taylor i i also don't think it's a a, a crazy thing like i know you probably took a ton of shit for this and i saw a bunch of it on twitter but at the end of the day like regardless of whether it was right or wrong like you did build this thing i can understand why you would want to do that and certainly from at least my point of view for 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 whether that matters or not is a different <laughs> thing like i i think that i would hope that people that weren't just seeking drama could at least see that you were trying to do a, a service to the industry and maintaining that account right and i mean i hope people see that but i understand that it may not have come across that way or you know obviously like when when everyone was confused and when there was like a limited amount of information and you know the rumor mill was flying and you know these types of things like obviously regardless of my intentions like you know did my intentions sort of carry through and carry across this ecosystem and i think that's mm -hmm. one of the i don't know if it's like one of my pain points in this the industry right now or like one of the things that frustrates me about the industry right now but I really dislike how fragmented and disparate like all these different communities have become and it's like everyone hangs out in like these telegram or discord or slack or riot or whatever you know all these little chat rooms mm -hmm. that are surrounding these projects and tokens and I feel like like I understand why that's happened but I also miss the days where the core information was all shared on Reddit. <laughs> that was really yeah. nice, you know. I think the the irony of all of that, right, is we're we're in a space where we're, we're looking to empower decentralization. Yet, what what is actually happening is the the centralization of communications and relationships in amongst that, and it's pretty much just fueling drama. It kind of feels like this whole space, not to tarnish the entire space, but overall i think it just needs to grow up a little bit and i think that comes with the stage that we're at right now as well but also just the more kind of companies and individuals that are working together in ultimately a space that's fueled by open source decentralized projects it's only going to benefit things mm -hmm. absolutely absolutely and yeah i really i hope that we sort of see you know it doesn't necessarily have to be reddit like that's what our ethereum you know used to be like the one place that you'd go to for all conversation and news it doesn't necessarily need to be reddit but i hope that we see the conversations come back to i don't know like more forum based so that they're searchable and the knowledge can be reused yeah. later open and things happening in public you know and so the biggest problem i have with like the telegram channels for example you know one it's like horrendous to search or keep track of everything but two yeah. most of the channels are focused around these projects or these tokens or these icos and they're not focused around like common goals so they're not focused mm -hmm. around you don't have like an education telegram or a like I, you know what i mean right you have a telegram that's focused around this one project and usually their one token or whatever it is and every other message is like when is the price going to go up i invested <laughs> when is the price going to go yeah. up You're like okay got to mute this channel right exactly <laughs> and so you know i think that having more like goal faced or problem solving structured conversations or channels or forums or whatever it is i think that that would be such an immense 
help for new people entering the space, but also like people that are that are a little bit more established in this space so that they can really contribute back into the ecosystem. Because right now, like I don't know what goes on in in these hundreds of telegram channels and I'm not contributing to those conversations. And there the discussions that are happening in those channels that are valuable, they're not making their way back to me so that it influences my product and I can learn from their experiences and, you know, those sorts of things. And I think that the best world is going to be one where everything that I've learned from whether it's the company, the team, our product, some like very particular bug in in a library somewhere, like whatever it is, right? Like the best world mm -hmm. is one where all of that knowledge is accessible to everyone else in this space that's building products and all of their knowledge is accessible to me so that I don't make the same mistakes that they have. And I just don't feel like that's happening right now very much. <laughs> and I really wish that we could figure out a way to do it. I think we can all certainly agree on that. And hopefully things like not just our podcast, but many of the other great podcasts out in the space will help at least to a certain extent share more open information. And on that note, I just wanted to say, Taylor, thank you so much for coming on the show. It's been really great fun talking with you. And honestly, I'm I'm really excited to learn a little bit more and see what the future holds for my crypto and also for you personally in the space. Uh, I have no doubt that you're going to go on and be a, a huge leader in, in, in this space over the next few years, if not, you already are right now. But just before we finish up, why don't you just let our listeners know where they can hear more from you and, and how they can find out a little bit more on some of the projects you're working on? Yeah, absolutely. So the main sort of the place I prefer right now to talk with people is Twitter. So we have the twitter.com slash my crypto, which is the company's Twitter. And then I now have my own personal Twitter, which is Tayvano. So T-A-Y-V-A-N-O. And then a little underscore doodad because someone else apparently has my same name but <laughs> if you just search if you search my crypto on twitter you'll see the my crypto twitter but also like my personal account our cmo jordan his personal account a lot of our team members are on twitter as well with their personal accounts and then beyond that i think if you go to mycrypto.com check out the site obviously but in the footer we have all the social media links and that's probably the easiest way to like, you know, if you want to stay updated on our blog, we got it on Medium. If you really like LinkedIn for whatever reason, we have a LinkedIn that you can follow <laughs> <laughs> all the standard ones. But if you just want to like say what's up to me, if you have a question, if you're like entering the space and you want to know where to start or whatever it is, just yeah, DM me on Twitter. DMs are always open on both my, my crypto Twitter and my personal Twitter. So that's that's the best place to, to grab us. Great. Thanks again, Taylor, for coming on. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. And this podcast, I listened to a couple episodes. I'm really, really impressed with what you guys are doing. I think you're taking the right approach and definitely appreciate your sort of education UX design mindset. It's definitely something that's needed in this space. And I applaud you for taking the initiative and doing a podcast about it. Oh, great. Thanks so much. Awesome. Well, take care, guys. Thank you again. Thanks for listening. If you love this episode and want to show your appreciation to myself and Matt, give us a review on iTunes or your favorite podcasting platform. We really appreciate that. You can also visit thecoinoffering.com to learn more about cryptocurrencies, get caught up on some news, see how your currency is performing. And you can follow us on Twitter at The Coin Offering, as well as email us at podcast at thecoinoffering.com if you'd like to get in touch. The contents of the Decrypting Crypto podcast should not be used and are not intended as investment advice. Please do your own due diligence before making any investment, cryptocurrency or otherwise.